Hey everybody, I'm JJ, you're watching Reality Survival, and so today I thought I would do a little video on the history of Israel. Um, I've heard a lot of people talking about, you know, it's rightfully the Israelis' land, it's rightfully the Palestinians' land, who, you know, whose land is it, who deserves to be there, who has legitimate rights to it, all that kind of stuff. So, I, I wasn't uh, extremely educated on this, and so I just did some research, and I'm gonna, we're gonna go back to basically the beginning of time, <laughs> and and uh, figure out who, who's who's who has the rights to Israel, and we're gonna bring that all the way up through the current time frame. So this might be the most interesting or perhaps the most boring video I've ever done. <laughs> I don't know for sure. You, you be the judge. You can, you can put that in the comments below and let me know what you think. Um, so like I said, I've got some notes here. Um, kind of broken it up into a few big sections. Um, and what I'm trying to do, what I tried to do with this is I tried to kind of highlight when the Jews had control of the territory and when somebody else had control of the territory. And, uh, and then kind of highlighting the time frames and the periods and the years and everything like that. Um, and so, and then we'll talk at the end, I'll give you my opinion on the, to on the topic after looking at all the information and everything and, and considering, um, you know, all, all of this, I'll give you my, my kind of thoughts on it and, you know, whatever. It's just, just my thoughts. It doesn't, doesn't mean anything. All right, so here we go. History of Israel. So we'll start out with the pre-Israelite period. Pre-Israelite period. So before the establishment of the kingdoms of Israel and Judah, the region was inhabited by various ancient people, such as the Canaanites and the Philistines. And um, it was influenced or controlled by powerful imp empires like Egypt. So the Canaanites, uh, descendants of Cain, <laughs> oddly enough, um, and the Philistines. So the Philistines are not the same as the Palestinians. Some people have conflated the two, and uh, the Philistines were actually sea people. They were from the islands of like Crete and uh, around the areas of like the Aegean Sea and Greece and you know different places in, in, in that area in the Mediterranean Sea who came over uh, to that area. So not the same as Palestinians. Now there has been some recent DNA research that suggests that the Canaanites may or the, the Palestinians may actually be related to the Canaanites. Um, so if you want to go back to the oldest periods in history, then you might be able to make a claim that way, although the Canaanite people do not really exist anymore, for the most part, uh, as, as any sort of a coherent nation. The Jewish state, obviously, is still um, you know a people, a recognized people. But uh, there may be some blood relation to the Canaanites. Okay, And I'm going to be as... Uh, non-biased in this as I can because the as you'll see the information goes back and forth back and forth like it's it's not a clear there there is not a clear establishment in this at all it's very complicated and that's why it I had to research it and, and look this up because it, the topic is is convoluted at best so then um, you know that time frame the pre-israelite we're talking about 1500 and B, 1500 BC and before. That's kind of the, I just kind of threw that out there. That's kind of our cutoff. I figure 3,500 years of history should be a long enough time for the timeline. You might even be able to go back to the Sumerians and, and all that kind of stuff, but I don't know that they really got out that far. But anyhow, um, so let's, let's take a look at uh, the, the Judges period. Now, the Judges period is from about 1500 to 1100 BC. And according to the Bible, before the establishment of the monarchy in Israel, there was a period where the Israelites were led um, by, you know, judges uh, from the Bible. 
So that wasn't really the establishment of a nation by any real definition. And so I don't know that we can count that as being um, when they were in control of it, because if I remember the stories and everything, that there wasn't any real clear ruler of Israel at that point. Uh, they were still, you know, sort of warring with uh, the different nations and stuff in the area. So, all right, so the first period where we very clearly have the Jews in control of the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah is about 1050 to about 586 BC. During that, whatever, 400 and however many years, 30 years, 50 years, whatever it is, uh, period, they pretty solidly were in control of the land that we think of as Israel today, for the most part. Um, they were they were a pretty sovereign kingdom. Um, then at around let's see, and there's a little there's a little overlap in some of these dates, but um, at about 722 BC, we we start to see Assyrian rule in the area. So there's a there's a little overlap there with the um, with the 586 BC. So, it, but at some point, the Assyrians come in and they conquer the area. Um, I think it's primarily the northern kingdom of Israel falls to the Assyrians. So then, um, from about 586 to about 539 BC. We have the Babylonian exile, and most all of the Jews are forced out of Israel. And, um, you know, again, they're exiled. They're, they're pushed out of the country. And so there's a period there where the Babylonians uh, are controlling the area, and there there's no Jews around there, uh, you know, for the most part. Might be small, small amounts and stuff like that, but, you know, for the most part, they're done. Um, now, I will also say that um, we're focusing on the, the Jewish side of the house here, but the uh, Canaanites and, and or Palestinians, which we'll get the, to that later, also have a equally as long a period of occupation in the area. So they have both occupied this area uh, pretty simultaneously to one degree or the other. Okay, so then, uh, let's see here. So yeah, the southern kingdom of Judah is conquered when the Babylonians come in and the first temple was destroyed. So then we have Persian rule, and the Persian rule goes from roughly 539 to 332 BC. And while the Jews returned and rebuilt the temple, the region, even though the Jews were living there, the region was under Persian Dominion. It was under their control, the Persians' control. So that's the modern-day Iranians. So, I mean, if we want to go back this far, maybe the Iranians can make a claim on Israel as well. <laughs> All right, and then we get the Hellenistic rule, and that is from roughly 332 to 167 B.C. And then we have the second period of clear Jewish control of Israel. And that is from the Hasmonean dynasty from 167 to 63 BC. They uh, got their independence after the Maccabean revolt against the Seleucid Empire. So during that period, that's roughly a hundred year period or so, they clearly controlled the area and were able to be an autonomous sovereign region, basically. Um, let's see... And then so, yeah, then you had Alexander the Great's conquests, and during that period they had varying degrees of Hellenistic influence. Uh, we had the Roman rule start at about 63 BC and um, moved until the 4th, and, that, and that, that lasted until about the 4th century AD. So Judea was incorporated into the Roman Empire. The second temple was destroyed in 70 AD. So even though during the time of, of Jesus, um, you know, they occupied the area, they still didn't control it. That was actually Roman territory. Okay, so now 
we've got the uh, about 132 to 136 AD, we had the Bar Coba, uh revolt against the Romans. The province was renamed uh, from Judea to Syria Palestinia. So this is the first point in history that I was able to find that the word Palestine basically uh, was was referenced and it's really Palestinia but you know it's, it's kind of where the, the whole Palestine thing started was about that time frame at about 132 to 136 AD and Jerusalem also had its name name changed from uh, from Jerusalem to Alia Capitolinia now, the rebellion was the third major Jewish and Roman conflict, and it resulted in a devastating defeat for the Jewish inhabitants of the region, and they were all pretty much forced out again. Now, again, maybe there were a handful or very few left living in the region, but most of them were forced out. So then we have the Byzantine rule from the 4th century to the 638 AD. Again, that's basically just a continuation of the Roman rule, but with Christianity as the dominant religion. And so, and you know, that, uh, there, was, there was some consternation at that point as well. All right, so then we have the early Muslim caliphates, and they were from 638 to 1099 AD. Uh, different caliphates controlled the region, uh, and they had Islamic governance. And depending on the caliphate, depending on how well the relationship was between them, some of them uh, were not very tolerant and, and um, you know, accepting of them being involved in really any level of control of the society, and other ones were more so. So it just, just sort of depended. Um... Then we've got the Crusader Kingdoms from 1099 to 1291 AD. And that is where we've got European and Christian control over, you know, pretty big parts of the region. Then we have the Ayyubid and Mameluk periods from 1171 to 1517 AD, sort of the Middle Ages time frame. And the Muslim dynasties controlled the region after driving out the Crusaders. So again, it was contentious, to say the least. Um, then you've got the Ottoman rule from the Ottoman Empire from 1517 to 1917. So 400 years, the Ottoman Empire ruled the land of Israel. Yes, there were some Jews there. Uh, there was some occupation there. But it was not their country. Um, they existed there, but they were not the lawful, um, you know, owners, <laughs> so to speak, or, or uh, administrators of the, of the area. So then, after the Ottoman Empire, we have the third period where the Israelis actually control the territory. So we're going to break this down further. So then we get the, the creation of the modern state of Israel uh, from 1948 to the present. And that was established after the end of the British Mandate. So let's talk a little bit about the British Mandate. This is the Zionist movement. And the early Zionist activity started from about 1900 to about 1914. You had a group of people who were called the Aliyahs who were promoting the Jewish immigration to Palestine. Um, and it was called the, under the British um, mandate, it was the British mandate of Palestine. And so that is where you start to see the region being called Palestine was about 1900. Again, we had an earlier mention of it, but the, it wasn't really widely known or used as, as the area um, during that time frame. And it wasn't until earlier in the 1900s when Palestine became at least uh, widely accepted or widely used from what I could find. So... Um, yeah, so from roughly 1900 to 1923 in total, um, you had the, the, an increased amount of Jewish immigration from Eastern Europe down into Israel. So then you had the, the first community called the Kibbutz, um, or, which is called a Kibbutz, I guess. Um, that community was named uh, Degania, and that was founded in 1909. So 1909 was really the first point in the modern state 
where they had an actual community being controlled by Jews. Uh, then you had the founding of Tel Aviv later that year, in 1909, Tel Aviv was established on the outskirts of Jaffa. So then we had uh, World War I and the Balfour Declaration and the Sykes-Picot Agreement. Now the Sykes-Picot Agreement is a pretty important um, thing to understand. And so in roughly 1916, the, the Sykes-Picot Agreement between Britain and France proposed the division of the Ottoman Empire's territories in the Middle East. The agreement conflicted with promises made to the Arabs about a single unified Arab state and didn't consider uh, Zionist aspirations in Palestine. And so, basically, the Sykes-Picot Agreement, from the way I understand it, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong in the, in the comments, but um, was the beginning of the foundation for how they were going to break up those states in that area. And so it was really kind of the creation document for um, how they were going to break up uh, Lebanon and Syria and Jordan and Israel and, and maybe even partially Egypt. I'm not 100% sure. But, um, so that whole region, is they were kind of drawing out the map. They were getting an idea, kind of figuring out where they're going to you know, put who, who's going to run things and all that kind of stuff. So they um, were, were given, they, they, or they assumed this authority. Now, whether you, you say that that's legitimate or not, maybe that's in question, I don't know. So 1917, British, uh, the, Britain issued the Balfour Declaration supporting a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine. In 1918, British and Arab forces uh, captured Palestine from the Ottomans. And then you have the British mandate from 1920 to 1947. So that's kind of just the whole period that it was there. Now, in 1920, you had the San Remo Conference uh, confirmed, which confirmed British's mandate over Palestine as initially outlined in the Sykes-Picot Agreement and the mandate the mandate's terms incorporated the Balfour Declaration. 1922, the League of Nations formally confirmed the British mandate for Palestine. So, 1922 is the first point at which we have a, you know, a whatever you a global body similar to what what eventually became the UN um, say Britain is going to have the say over this area and how it's going to be. Um, utilized going forward. So in 1929, then you had uh, tensions that led to the Western Wall riots over the Jewish access to the wall. Uh, from 1936 to 1939, the Arab revolt in Palestine, protest against British rule and Jewish immigration. So it isn't only the Jews that were upset, you know, the, the Arabs were also fighting and there was, you know, constant upheaval in this whole thing. Then, uh, let's see here, 1939, the British White Paper uh, limited Jewish immigration and aimed for an independent Palestine governed by Arabs and Jews. So, you know, around 1939 time frame, they were starting to go to say, okay, hold off on, on the Jews coming in here. We're going to try to, we're going to think about the idea of a jointly run state. So then we have World War II and the Holocaust. We get the extermination of, you know, six million Jews in Nazi Germany. Um, you also have Jewish resistance groups like the Haganah and the Irgun and the Lehi who fight against British rule, aiming, you know, to create a Jewish state. And then we have the post-war period. Um, leading to the establishment of Israel, and that period was roughly 1945 to 1948. From in 45 and 46, the Jewish insurgency against the British rule intensified. I wasn't previously aware that that they had fought back um, and you know were fighting for their own sovereignty. I thought that was interesting. Then in 1947, British referred uh, the Palestine issue to the United Nations. In November 29th, 1947, the UN passed Resolution 181 recommending the partitioning 
of Palestine into Jewish and Arab states. So the key points from the UN Partition Plan, that's Resolution 181, included the division of territory. Uh, the plan proposed to divide the British Mandate of Palestine into two separate areas, one Jewish and one Arab, uh, with Jerusalem being placed under special international administration due to the unique significance of multiple religions. The Jewish state was uh, to receive roughly 56% of the land area and the Arab state roughly 44%. Uh, at the end of the British Mandate, the plan sought an end to the British Mandate in Palestine, which had um, been in place since 1920, and the British had earlier expressed their intention to terminate their mandate by no later than August 1, 1948. And let's see here, the economic union, a detailed plan was set, was set for an economic union between the proposed states to manage trade services and other key aspects that would ensure economic sustainability. However, the plan was met with acceptance from the Jewish, or yeah, with, with acceptance from the Jewish community in Palestine, but strong opposition from the Arab community and the surrounding Arab states who were against the establishment of a Jewish state and the partition of Palestine. The plan was never implemented, and the immediate response to the resolution was an increase in violence leading to a civil war between Jews and Arabs in the territory. So despite the failure uh, to implement the plan peacefully, it provided a legal basis and an international legitimacy for the Jewish leadership's declaration of independence on the state of Israel. On May 14, 1948, David Ben-Gurion the head of the Jewish agency, proclaimed the establishment of the State of Israel. And this proclamation cited in the UN Partition Plan explicitly, or cited the UN Partition Plan explicitly. The following day, the armies of several Arab countries invaded the new state, marking the beginning of the 1948 Arab-Israeli War. Now, the reason, I'm, I've got a little bit more here uh, that I want to cover, but it, this last part might be the most important part and part of the reason why I did this video. And that is because there's a lot of people out there right now who are really, really concerned that, you know, that there's the second coming of Christ and, you know, that it's going to be Armageddon and that this, this whole thing means because Israel is getting in a war in its homeland that this thing, that this is the one, this is the big one. And... They've been in a lot of a lot of fights since 1948, and I'm going to list them all off here for you. Um, and that's part of the reason why I wanted to share this with you guys is because take a breath. It this this doesn't mean that we're going into the Battle of Armageddon. I promise. Um, I mean, I surely I could be wrong, but I just I just don't think that just because there's a war in Israel that it, that that's necessarily what it means because there's been a lot of them. So we had the Civil War from uh, 47 and 48. We get the establishment of the, of the state on May 14th, followed by the Arab-Israeli War from 48 to 49. Uh, Israel defends its territory against the neighboring nations, and they win. So by modern definitions of sovereignty, that right there is a pretty good claim that they are in control of that territory. Because... In 1948, they declared that it's theirs. Nations went to war. They won. Okay? No different than the, the, the establishment of many other states all around the world. Right? That's the sort of the standard for how things go. If you fight a war and you win, you control the territory. That's just, and you got to be able to keep it. But that's, that's where we're going next. So then we've got the 1956 Suez Crisis, where Israel in coordination with Britain and France, invades Egypt. And um, they, that, that, they ended up pulling out of that conflict and sort of both sides, and, and you'll see that in several points here, both sides sort of claim victory, <laughs> even though, you know who, know, who knows who really won, but Israel still maintained control of their territory. Then 1967, you have the Six-Day War, Israel achieves a rapid victory against Egypt, Syria, and Jordan, all the three primary countries um, surrounding it. And, and they captured, during that time frame, they captured 
the West Bank, Gaza Strip, Sinai Peninsula, and the Golan Heights. So at that point in 1967, they controlled basically all of modern Israel. Every bit of it was theirs. 1973, you have the Yom Kippur War. Egypt and Syria launch a surprise attack on, on Israel, leading to the near critical situation before Israel recovers and pushes back. Again, both sides kind of, I, th I think if I remember right, both sides kind of claimed victory on that one too, but um, everything stayed pretty much the same as far as I could find. 1979, Israel and Egypt uh, peace treaty. They had that, marking the first peace agreement between Israel and an Arab country. So that's when relations started to normalize a little bit. 1982, you have the Lebanon War. Israel invades southern Lebanon to fight against the PLO, uh, People's Liberate, or Palestine Liberation Organize, Organization. So then in 93 and 90, to 95, you have the Oslo Accords, which was a peace process between Israel and the Palestinian Liberation Organization which led to mutual recognition. And in 1994, you have um, the Israel, and that's sort of in the middle of that, you have the Israel-Jordan Peace Treaty, solidifying relations with another neighboring Arab country. And by ethnicity, if I remember correct, you can fact check me if I'm wrong, uh, but I think that Jordan, the country of Jordan is about 85% Palestinian by ethnicity. Um, so when they say they don't have a home, that's, it's a little bit disingenuous because, I mean, a lot of their relatives are real close by. Um, so 2000 to 2005, uh, you've got the second intifada, and that was a period of intensified Palestinian, Palestinian and Israeli violence. 2006, you have the second Lebanon war against Hezbollah in the southern Lebanon. 2008. 2012, 2014, you have the Gaza Wars, a series of conflicts between Israel and the Hamas and the Gaza Strip. And then 2020, you have the Abraham Accords where Israel establishes dip diplomatic relations with the UAE and Bahrain, later to be joined by Sudan and Morocco. And up to 2023, Saudi starts to look like they are going to sign on to the Abraham Accords and the, then this nonsense all kicks off and we get the, uh, the war that started on October 7th. I think it was the 7th, yeah. Um, so, uh, it's not clear that anybody can make a historical claim on the land of Israel. <laughs> if you want to look at historical claims, because both the Palestinians and the Jews have lived there in and throughout the region for thousands of years. Um, if you look at the most, the more modern um, time frames within the last hundred years or so, uh, Israel certainly has a stronger claim to it, in my opinion. This is again, this is where we're just getting my opinion here, because they fought for it and they won and it was theirs, and ever since then, they have defended it. Now, up to this point, they've allowed the uh, Palestinians to live there when they didn't have to. And it was clear that, you know, during the 1967 uh, war, they they had control of everything. They could They could have pushed everybody out and never let anybody back in, but they didn't, and they tried, they have tried, for a very long time to coexist with them and live peacefully. But that's not working. And I suspect that it's this this war has the potential to be fairly serious and, and fairly long lasting. Uh, I don't think that that means that it's, you know, going to be, you know, Armageddon and all that kind of stuff, like I said. Uh, it definitely could go sideways because there's so many other geopolitical factors that are going on in the region and the shifting of power and all that kind of stuff. So it, it is a fairly serious uh, situation, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be the end of the world or anything like that. Um, Israel is very capable and, you know, to date, 
of all the, the wars that they fought in, they've never clearly lost anything, any, any of these wars. Um, now, like I said, sometimes both sides claim victory and all that kind of stuff, and maybe the maybe it's not exactly clear, but they certainly haven't lost control of their state since it was formed in 48. Um, so that is the best I can do to explain the whole situation with Israel uh, and uh, the Palestinians. It's convoluted at best. Uh, if you want to say who was there first, then based off DNA evidence, you'd say the Palestinians get the, get the oldest in line, you know, for, for control of the area, so to speak. Although I don't think that you can make a very good case that the Canaanites were continuously there and, and are even a, still a recognized people group and, and that kind of stuff, just because they have some DNA connections uh, going back that, to that far doesn't necessarily mean that they have fought and, you know, multiple times over and over and over and over and over again throughout history to try to maintain control of the area that they believe is their homeland. Um, I think that I think the the Jews have a better case in that regard than uh, the Palestinians do, and I also think that if you don't recognize the legitimacy of the claim of Israel, then you also shouldn't recognize the legitimacy of the states of Syria and Lebanon and Jordan and potentially even Egypt, because the the agreements and and the processes that were done to establish those borders, uh, aside from the Jews fighting for it in that initial civil war, are the same processes that, you know, the Sykes-Picot agreement and all that, that establish all those other countries. So if you're going to say that Israel can't be there or doesn't have control of it, you know, as, as a nation, then you also have to say that neither does Jordan and Israel and Lebanon and all these other ones. So you can't, to me, you can't really have one you know, and the other at the same time, you can't have a cake and eat it too. You've got to, you've got to have some sort of consistency. And it seems to me that, um, at least within the last hundred years, the um, consistency is clearly on the side of the Egyptians, and the Palestinians have not ever really taken advantage of the opportunity um, that was presented there. Even going back to when the UN and uh, the League of Nations tried to establish a joint state, and they just flat out refused. Um, so, now they did agree later on in the Oslo Accords and, and all that kind of thing, but again, that was a, a lot more recent. And even since then, there's been tons and tons of turmoil and fighting, and they've never really established a clear and functioning government, and they've never tried to establish a real economy. Um, a lot of people in the news right now and on you know different YouTube channels are using the term open air prison that that's how they're living so um, there's just a difference between the two and it seems to me very clear that uh, it is the, it is the Jewish nation Israel is a Jewish nation they have legitimate control over it and if the Palestinians are going to live there then they should do so without being violent and it, and they risk when they, when they choose to be violent, when they choose to support people who are violent, then they risk the consequences. And trust me, there will be very bad consequences because Benjamin Netanyahu is a hardliner and, you know, this was their 9-11. They're going to feel the consequences um, if they're even allowed to stay in Gaza. I mean, we'll, we'll see how that all goes. Um, but I don't think that they're going to allow it to be to them to exist the same way that they have. There's probably going to be a greater degree of security presence and all that kind of stuff if they're allowed to stay um, permanently at all. So we'll see. I don't really know. Um, but now you know everything that I know about Israel <laughs> and the history of Israel when it comes to who controlled the land and all that. Um, basically three times throughout history, Israel had sovereign control over their territory. Aside from those three times, it's been ruled by other people and other claims on it. They lived there, but they weren't in control. So, 
What does that mean? I don't know. I just find it interesting. I find, you know, studying this old stuff, I, I find fascinating. Hey, uh, I just want to let you guys know, I'm going to wrap this up here, but I want to let you guys know that we have a cell phone app called the American Prepping Academy. You can download this on your phone now. It's live. We've got like 13 different channels um, on here. And whenever these channels upload a video to their account within 24 hours, it will show up in the app and you'll get a little notification inside the app that uh, they put up a new video. So let me tell you channels. We got we got Tactical Comms, we got Renaissance Marine, we have Stoker, Stokermatic, we have Rule the Wasteland, Iridium 242, we have The Prepared Adventist, uh, my second channel, DIY, JJ's DIY Homestead, and we've got Leatherneck Prepper, Crafty Veteran, Skinny Medic, Modern Refugee, and Ethical Preparedness. So those are all the channels that are over there now. If you guys have a favorite prepping channel that you'd like to see added to the app, then I would just ask you to take this uh, link. It's uh, https colon forward slash forward slash app. So app dot American Prepping Academy dot com. And they can and you just put that in their comments section and let them know, hey, I'd love for you guys to load your videos to this app and uh, it's free for everybody to do it right now and so it's super easy to set up an account all they got to do is get a 350 by 100 banner and then make a couple of clicks and put in a little bit of info literally 10 minutes you can have the whole account set up and it'll automatically pull in your last hundred videos and it'll update them as you go along so you don't even have to do anything as a content creator to maintain your account um, it's, it's going to be fairly easy to do. So anyway, check that out. It's the American Prepping Academy app on both the Google Play Store and on Apple. Now, it does. there is a, a limit to the version. If you have a five-year-old phone, it's probably not going to work. Um, but anyhow, and we're trying to get it opened up to um, more countries as well. I think right now it's just the United States and Canada where it's available, but we're going to try to open it up. Uh, to more countries. So if you live someplace else and you, you don't see it available, we're working on that. But anyway, thanks for watching, folks. Don't forget to live the six Ps. Proper prior preparation prevents poor performance. Stay safe.